bioactive. That word seems to be everywhere in the reptile world right now, from plants to animals, substrate, and everything in between. But a lot of people are using it like it's bioautomatic. Maybe we should be keeping up with regular maintenance. I certainly think so. Let's take a closer look. Hey, Tim. Yep. Pretty into cars, right? Yeah, man, I love cars. So I just got a new car and the dealer said that it has forever oil in it and I never need to change the oil. Was it have some additive or something? Dude, he said like three times. It's got like bioactive in it. <laughs> you need to change your oil, like regularly. Bioactive terrarium setups like this one here have become one of the most popular ways to keep many species of reptiles and amphibians, especially those that are forest dwelling and love a planted habitat. Now, having a planted terrarium is a fantastic way to not only make your animals happy and healthy, but it's a beautiful addition to your living room or your reptile room. But contrary to what many people may assume, bioactive doesn't really mean set it and forget it. While a planted terrarium full of healthy plants and microfauna, like springtails and isopods, does dramatically reduce the amount of maintenance you need to keep your terrarium healthy, there's one highly overlooked part of terrarium maintenance that may start to harm your plants and animals if you don't stay on top of it. So you may remember our substrate intro video where Tim talked about the different layers that are in dirt that he dug up outside. Now to better understand our bioactive setup, we need to compare it to nature. That's what we're trying to mimic. Out in nature, the cycle of plants growing, then dying, falling to the ground, being broken down into rich soil, and then growing new plants again, happens continuously. It'll be easier to explain if I take you to our favorite jungle, Madagascar. So I guess her travel budget wasn't big enough to send me to Madagascar. So let's use the next best thing the Leap Reptile Lab, which we've painstakingly set up to provide the exact same climate as the Midland regions of central Madagascar. Let's let Tim show us a more in-depth look at the layers that are in tropical soil. The top layer in tropical soil is all of the fresh plant matter that's fallen from trees or has grown and died on the forest floor. This leaf layer also provides an entire habitat for small reptile amphibians to hide in, hunt, or even nest. As the leaves and sticks break down with the help from bacteria, the critters that live in the soil, and a little bit of reptile poop, this layer slowly turns into nutrient-rich soil. Living plants take nutrients from this layer, grow, and die again, creating the top layer of fresh plant matter to break down repeating the process all over again. Now, this is the really important part. Without fresh material to break down, the soil would lose nutrients over time and become significantly less healthy and more compacted, which will keep the plants from growing as well. And if the pH drops too low, it can be harmful to all living creatures. So in terrariums that we have at home, we don't have nearly the volume or quality of fresh plant matter falling on the ground that would occur in a tropical forest. Therefore, the cycle that occurs in nature can't really happen in our terrarium without our intervention. So an easy way to ensure that the cycle continues as it should is simply to top off that top layer of bark and leaf litter. As it breaks down, you just top it off. This simulates the influx of new material that we would only see in the forest. But that's only two components of your substrate. As you'd imagine, there's a lot more to this. So what are you doing this weekend? Uh, I think I'm gonna head to Potts Hill to the reptile show and get some super worms, maybe some dubias. Yeah, I'm gonna grab a glass of water, you want Uh, no, I'm good, thanks, Jack. All right, Whoa. What? You know that you need to replace that filter now, right? Dude, it's got charcoal in it. Lasts forever. Charcoal, or activated carbon, or just carbon, is by far one of the best additives that you can put in your substrate. It has amazing cleaning powers that come from its structure and the fact that it's a natural substance that doesn't chemically react with the rest of the ingredients in your substrate. Generally speaking, charcoal is made by burning wood in an oxygen-poor environment, creating an extremely porous remnant. Think of what's left of your logs after you put out a campfire. 
But why is charcoal so good at filtering? It's because of the pores. If we look at charcoal under a microscope, you can see that there are millions and millions of tiny pores. What pores do is create an enormous surface area of little pockets that will trap contaminants in the substrate. Because these pores are microscopic, they can even trap molecules that cause bad smells, helping your substrate stay fresh and keeping from getting that gross, rotting egg smell to it as your natural materials break down. But there is one problem with charcoal being so good as a filter. Like any filter, over time it gets clogged up with all the stuff that it has filtered. What? Dude, what are you doing? You said we had to replace the charcoal and the natural materials. You don't have to take it out piece by piece. It's actually a lot simpler than that. I seriously thought I was getting the hang of this. Let's tackle the gross reason why you need to change your substrate regularly. And it's one of the two reasons that can actually cause really bad health effects for both your animals and your plants. There's no easy way to say it, but animal waste. Ew. Cameraman David, can we please go back to the studio to shoot the rest of this? I can't take the smell, man. So I'd much rather be filming this here than back at that smelly sewage treatment plant we were at earlier. Now this reason to change your substrate is pretty straightforward, but it's also super important. So these guys are living animals, obviously. And all animals, whether we want to admit it to somebody we just started dating or not, produce biological waste. And yeah, I do mean feces and urine. So no matter how on top of cleaning up after your animal you are, the waste from these guys accumulates in the substrate. And it's not in the form of feces itself, it's in the form of the nutrients and elements that make up that feces. Not all of these nutrients are present in the right ratios, and not all of them are ideal for your plants and animals. Over time, as these nutrients and the feces itself builds up, we have to remove it from the substrate by doing a substrate exchange. There's no real way around this. Even a perfect bioactive habitat full of nature's cleanup crew of isopods, microfauna, and all the other good biological critters you have in there can't entirely eliminate all waste forever. As waste builds up in unnatural concentrations, these microfauna will also be negatively affected and could potentially die. So why do a substrate change? Just like in an aquarium, eventually, the best solution to keeping things clean, regardless of how good your filter is, is to simply change the water. Over time, the buildup of animal waste can attract disease, bad smell, and even unhealthy bugs to your terrarium. But those might not even be the most dangerous reasons that you need to change your substrate. So what is one of the more dangerous natural processes that might be harming your substrate? Well, it's acidification of your substrate, or how you may accidentally be turning your beautiful terrarium substrate into a substance that can actually harm your plants and critters. Acidification occurs over time in a terrarium from a variety of processes. While we could spend an hour talking about this stuff in depth, we're going to try to give you an overview of why the substrate in your terrarium can become toxic in the first place. So the first reason is that as plant material or any other natural material starts to break down over time, it releases hydrogen ions. Now what's interesting about hydrogen ions is that they're the basis of all acids. So when, they, when these ions bond with other chemicals, it's going to create an acid in your substrate. Hmm. An even more common reason for soil acidification in your terrarium is quite simply just plant growth in general. As the plants in your terrarium grow, they absorb naturally occurring nutrients, calcium, magnesium, potassium, which are all alkaline substances, the opposite of an acid. Because these are all basic, as the elements are used up, the soil naturally becomes more acidic. Hey Tim, thanks for explaining all that, but let's take a quick step back and explain pH just a little bit. So this is our pH scale, and it goes all the way from zero, which is the most acidic something can be, up to 14, which is the most basic or the opposite of acid that something can be. Now pure water sits right here in the middle at neutral, right at seven. Now you may think that your plants like to grow right in the middle at seven on the pH scale, and you'd be mostly right, but a lot of tropical soil in nature is actually slightly acidic, somewhere between 5.4 and 6.5. That's the range that we want to craft in our substrate. But how do we know what our soil pH is? Let's go back to Tim for the answer. There's two different ways that we like to test a soil or substrate's pH. One is cheap and easy, and the other one is almost as easy, but a good bit more expensive. 
The cheap and easy way is with one of these readily available probe type pH testers. For around 20 bucks, you stick it in your substrate and read off what the pH measures. But how does it compare to the more scientific way? The other way we used was developed by Michigan State University. You'll need a couple of measuring cups and some water, as well as a larger cup to mix everything up in. You combine four ounces or half a cup of substrate with a full cup of water for a ratio of one part substrate and two parts water. Stir it all up, let it sit for a few minutes, and use your calibrated, expensive pH meter. Let's see how much the test results differ. No matter how you test your substrate's pH, simply knowing that over time, substrate tends to become acidic is what matters, and it matters a lot. If your substrate becomes too acidic, let's say below 5.0, your plants won't be able to properly take in nutrients and could eventually die. Also, certain microfauna can be sensitive to acidic soil, so those expensive isopods that you just spent a ton of money on at the reptile show may go completely to waste. Exchanging portions of your substrate regularly is how we fight this problem, because doing so replaces the acidic substrate with fresh, new, neutral substrate. Bioactive substrates are incredible for the health and beauty of our modern terrariums, but we can't possibly know all that there is to know about it by just researching online or having great conversations with friends. Sometimes experience is the absolute best way to learn valuable lessons and of course avoid hurting the animals that we love and are responsible for. It's important to stay on top of your substrate health through regular maintenance. But what can you do other than just regular substrate changes? Good points, Jack. Check out our upcoming substrate videos where we save you some time by showing you our own personal disasters and fails and teach you how to avoid them in the first place.